Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sabine Zierke, and on behalf of the uh, North American Studies Program, I'd like to welcome you to our last event in our lecture series. Our lecture ends in the midst of the final matches of the World Cup, but yet it also ends in a reflective, in fact, indeed a self-reflexive mode, and for me, also with much joy. For it is a particular pleasure to welcome, in fact, to welcome back to Bonn, a guest who is both an admired colleague and a dear friend. Professor Michel Boulos-Walker comes to us from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia, where she is a senior lecturer in the School of Historical and Philosophical Inquiry, head of the European Philosophy Research Group, and an affiliate of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities. Deeply engaged in scholarly exchanges on an international scale, she spent part of the summer, if you like, also part of the Australian winter, as visiting scholar at the University of Paderborn. And it is thanks to Paderborn for bringing you, Michelle, into our vicinity. Professor Bulus Walker's research interest spans the field of European philosophy, aesthetics, ethics, and feminist philosophy. And it was the latter, especially French feminist philosophy, where our interests cross, and we, we both found ourselves in a seminar taught by Alice Jardine, professor of Romance, languages, and literatures, and of studies of women, gender, and sexuality at Harvard University in the fall of 1987 that is more than 30 years ago. Michelle and I were both doing research for our PhD thesis at Harvard and in the Boston area, and the rest, of course, is history. Dr. Bolus Walker, uh, uh, Walker's own teaching interests include intersections of philosophy with politics, film, and literature. In both her research and her teaching, she is mainly concerned with the practice of philosophy, that is, with its historical, disciplinary, and institutional dimensions. As she further writes on her website, she is particularly interested, and I quote, in the internal threats to philosophy, its blind spots, exclusions, and silences, and its external threats, such as nowadays, the demands of the digi digital age. She just combines an engagement with the traditional questions and methods of philosophy with an investigation of the implications of these for contemporary issues of human agency and human knowledge, end of citation. Currently, she is working on a project that focuses on questions of philosophy and the politics of a subversive laughter, which many of us, of course, practice all the time. Michelle Boulos Walker holds BA and a graduate diploma in educational studies from the University of New England in New South Wales, as well as a PhD in philosophy from, from the University of Queensland. Her PhD thesis evolved into her first academic monograph published with Routledge in 1998, Philosophy and the Maternal Body, Reading Silence which explores the complex exclusions that keep women's voices silent within the history of Western philosophy. And I brought both uh, monographs and we can pass them around. In 1994, Michelle Boulos Walker edited a volume called Performing Sexualities for Brisbane's Institute of Modern Art. And in 2005, she published a major essay on behalf of the US visual artist Adrian, Lid Adrian Little, which highlights the range of her expertise. Her many publications in academic journals, including Australian Feminist Studies, the Australasian Journal of Philosophy, Philosophy Today, and the Philosoph Philosopher's Magazine, deal with the work of Emmanuel Levinas, Simone Weil, and Simone de Beauvoir, the Frankfurt School, with Jacques Lacan and Jean-François Lyotard, with Hélène Sessou, Luce Irigaré, and Michel, Michel Ledeuf. Most of these philosophers also make appearances in Professor Bullis Walker's second book, Slow Philosophy, Reading Against the Institution, published with Bloomsbury Academic in 2017. In that book, she examines the challenge of time uh, the challenge of time pressure on learning, pedagogy, and research in philosophy, and more broadly, in the humanities. 
Let me quote from the publisher's website. In an age of internet scrolling and skimming where concentration and attention are fast becoming endangered skills, it is timely to think about the act of reading and the many forms that it, it can take. Slow philosophy reading against the institution makes the case for thinking about reading in, philosoph in philosophical terms. Michel Boulos Walker argues that philosophy involves the patient work of thought. In this, it resembles the work of art, which invites and implores us to take our time and to engage with the world. At its best, philosophy teaches us to read slowly. In fact, philosophy is the art of reading slowly. And this inevitably clashes when, with many of our current institutional practices and demands. End of citation. The same may, of course, be said about the political arena where our attention gets diverted and absorbed by tweets and trivia. What Professor Walker envisages is an ethics of reading fueled by a love of wisdom and the desire to know. And this is clearly opposed to what fellow Australian philosopher Joan Faulkner, in a review of slow philosophy, calls today's university's tendency <coughs> to alienate and pervert philosophy into an ends-directed enterprise, an enterprise that too hurriedly settles upon answers and disciplines, th disciplines thought into systems. And this tendency, I may add, is by no means limited to the field of philosophy. Now, in her lecture tonight, Professor Bulus Walker will draw, on, draw from slow philosophy and present what she terms a modest proposal for change, offering an optimistic view of the important work we need to undertake in the university today. And I think this is a wonderful topic for a final lecture uh, in the summer term. And we kind of re reflect on that over the summer. But we, before we do that, we hear more from an expert. So please welcome with me, Michelle Boulos walker Vielen Dank für diese wunderbare Einladung nach Bonn. Ich bin wirklich glücklich, wieder hier zu sein. Es ist eine wunderbare Stadt und so eine wunderbare Universität. Und Sabine, Professor Silke ist wirklich eine, eine wichtige Person in meinem akademischen und auch meinem Personalleben. Und um, Sabine, I have never had such an introduction, so, so thorough, so lovely, and I really thank you very warmly for that. The, um, for some of you here, of course, for most of you here, the relationship that Sabina and I have developed both intellectually and, and personally over those years, these are 31 years, this is longer than you've been alive. It's much longer than you've been alive. And it's, it's a great gift uh, because we see each other regularly and we've been able to share many things in terms of our intellectual itineraries and, and journeys and, and much more as well. So it's really a delight to be here. It's, it's wonderful. I thank, I thank you, Zabina, and I thank Bonn University um, very warmly. Now, this paper I'm giving tonight, as Zabina has, as Professor Zilke, <laughs> Sabina has to, in Australia we would always say, use first names. Um, oh, just while we're waiting, I'll just oh, get. So that's where I come from. And that's, um, I'll, we'll go a little further in a moment. Um, as, as Sabina suggested, that the paper that I'm giving tonight is, it relates to this book. But it's really, in a sense, uh, a paper. Can you hear me at the back OK? It's really a paper that um, comes as a response to this book in many senses. Uh, once the book was published, interestingly, it found uh, quite an interest outside of philosophy as well as within philosophy. And so I've been asked to write quite a few um, speci non-specialist pieces in response to the work. And that was fabulous for a number of reasons. One of them being that it gave me an opportunity to think after the book and beyond the book and to, to ask myself some more difficult questions about the implications of what I'm saying here for what we're doing every day in the institution. I, I, I raise that in the book, but I've been able to go and think a little more beyond that. 
Now, when I saw the audience, I thought, this is a very young audience, which is delightful, of course. Um, extraordinarily young audience. <laughs> and, and that's fabulous. Um, but it, it occurs to me, just you know, in see, looking at the audience, it occurs to me that the paper is actually written probably for an older audience, in the sense that it's, for those of us who have been decades in the university and have experienced the frustrations as well as the, the great loves and triumphs of, of the experience, it's a, a paper that really speaks to that. So at first I was thinking, will this paper make any sense to a very young audience? And then I thought, after that I thought, yes, I hope it will, because what you're facing is connected in the sense that you're expected to get your degrees very quickly, you rush through courses, you rush from one course to another or, or one part of your life to another, and all too soon this university, this wonderful university life is, is complete or, or you're in another phase and there's not a lot of time for reflection. So I'm hoping that some of the, what I have to say today will, will resonate in that sense with what it means, and also in what it means in terms of when you're in seminars and tutorials, um, where there's too much to read and there's not enough time and it's frustrating and it's difficult and you just wonder how you can actually spend time with some few important thoughts. So that's, the, that's kind of a, a bit of a com context for it. I've just forgotten actually what I've put here. So, okay, there's, there's the book. And as I said, the, the talk is in a sense a response to the book. Uh, we'll come back to the question of, um, where's the actual point? Yeah, we'll come back to the question of philosophy, but philosophia is, is a large part of what I have to talk about tonight. Now, the paper's not very long, but it's in sections. So I'll start by looking at the paradox that I find myself in, having to make the case for slow philosophy, uh, but in an institutional context, which, as I'll argue, entails the revaluing of values that we that the university presently um, that exist in, with the university. Then I'll look at the connection of philosophy and art in terms of slow philosophy and its connections with aesthetic experience. Um, a, a penultimate section on responsibility and political engagement, because as Sabina mentioned, uh, pretty much all of the work that I do in philosophy is oriented, or, or the perspective comes from a philosophical questions of philosophical engagement, and then the, a post postscript, a very brief postscript, linking slow philosophy to slow activism, because I'm often asked questions about connections with things like slow food movement and. And often those slow movements are trivialized. And I want to just make a very brief case at the end for why we should not trivialize slow activism. So, and then right at the end, again very briefly, will be uh, just a few ideas to get us thinking and talking perhaps of, of what universities are for um, or what universities should be for in that sense. Okay, so we've got my university and we've got your university. So we'll leave it there for the moment. That's how it looks sometimes. It looks pretty nice. It actually looks like the Reichstag just before um, Christo erupted. <laughs> okay, so my recent book, Slow Philosophy, explores the importance of unhurried time in establishing our institutional encounters with complex and demanding works. It offers a critique of the corporatization of the institution and the implications this has for the way that we practice philosophy, or indeed, I think, any thoughtful intellectual endeavor today. So I'm hoping that this resonates with your own experiences. In this paper, I draw from the book to explore modest proposals for change, ones that return time and time again to attentive and reflective modes of thought, reading, and also interpersonal relations. I'll come to that. I stress the importance of philosophy as a mode of encountering complexity, and I suggest that because slow philosophy makes a case for resisting our instrumental relations with thinking and with our world much more broadly, it provides us with an optimistic view of the important work we need to undertake in the university today. 
as Abina mentioned, the, the question of optimi optimism here. Um, I think it's important to add the optimism quite simply just because we do have to continue and to survive within the institutional context. It's not always easy, uh, but it's, I think, important, especially when we speak to younger generations, to uh, address this in positive terms. So that here I go. Here's my attempt. So first, the paradox of making the case for slow philosophy. So there, the paradox of making the case for slow philosophy. Now, philosophy is traditionally a privileged mode of engaging with complexity, with the complexities of our world, a slow and unhurried process of extending perceptions, deepening resonances, and forging connections. It therefore benefits from the university as an institutional space that safeguards time. That's important. The transformative potential of philosophy that this situation enables is, one could say, with nature, uh, linked to its very untimeliness. And yet, as academic philosophers today, we're forced to make the claim for unhurried time against the university itself, against the excesses of a competitive, professional, and overly specialist culture of research defined by market-based imperatives of measurement, quantifiability, and evaluation, where the love of wisdom, philo, Sophia, is reduced to something more like a knowledge economy. So the institutional practice of philosophy today is anything but unhurried. And this is why it's important to talk about slow philosophy. So the paradox at one level is just simply that one's writing about the importance of untimeliness and unhurriedness and, and, and the trying to regain this contemplative relation with philosophy in a time where your career depends on the fact that you do nothing slowly, nothing in an unhurried way. We can think of slow philosophy as a critical practice that urges us to resist the haste of the competitive environment framing our contemporary public research cultures. By drawing our focus back to the temporal dimension of the work we do, slow philosophy helps us to reconstitute an attentive and open relation with the strangeness of the world through hesitation, deliberation, and taking time. And it does so initially as a way of reorienting ourselves within the institutional spaces in which philosophy itself becomes too familiar with efficiency and forms of bureaucratic reasoning or instrumental thought. Now, such inst instrumental reason reduces thought to calculation and to knowledge narrowly conceived as a commodica commodification of facts, a mechanism for achieving a predetermined end for containing and closing down thought. Slow philosophy, on the other hand, explores, contests, transforms, and questions. It's thought that acquaints itself with what is other and strange. And yet, perhaps somewhat paradoxically, we're forced in the current institutional context to make the case for slow philosophy as a non-instrumental form of thinking and practice instrumentally. For example, by spruiking slow philosophy's use value as an antidote to instrumental thinking or thoughtlessness. Now, it may just be because I'm a philosopher, but this paradox seems to me critical and important in terms of understanding how difficult it is to make this case. <coughs> or too, by offering slow philosophy as a means of engaging complexity rather than reducing, denying, overlooking, or ignoring it. Here, slow philosophy comes up against the framework of the modern neoliberal university all around us with its focus on impact variously defined. Now, I'll be really surprised if Bonn University doesn't also quake under the, 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 the force of impact and the need to demonstrate contemporary impact. Perhaps the difficulty of defining the practice of slow philosophy is that it is, in part, a response to the tension inherent in arguing a case for slow philosophy instrumentally. It's a kind of critical thinking designed to jam the machinery of what today we're increasingly referring to as the metrics of value, the largely unchallenged values that measure, quantify, and evaluate our critical work today. Now, the metrics of value should make each academic actually tremble, basically. 
and we are as individuals. I can see an American scholar nodding furiously and understanding. And it'll be interesting, perhaps in discussion later, to see how much that's the case in the German context. Um, so at an individual level, we are measured and weighed and quantified and reduced to extreme levels. But it's not just at the individual level, as terrible as that is. Our universities as well, the University of Queensland, the University of Bonn, are measured against each other in, in very commodified ways, in very um, mechanistic kinds of ways. All you need to do is look up the university's world rankings, check out where Bonn and, and Queensland are, I have, and you get this sense that we are part of a football league at best, totally for football, don't get me wrong there, but, um, but uh, yes, this, this question of the metrics of value infiltrates pretty much everything we do. And my argument is, is really ostensibly a very simple thing in the sense of what is left of thinking in an environment where something like the metrics of value basically orients and, and uh, circumscribes pretty much everything that we do. So thinking, whether it's in philosophy or whether it's in literature or, or, or cultural studies or wherever it be, thinking is what I think is under threat here. How then to introduce slow practices within the university to remain within the horizon of the university while managing to produce transformation, difference and change. So if we're going to stay, what do we do about it? If we can think of slow philosophy provisionally as something like the process of jamming the machinery or thwarting the pretensions of the metrics of value, that's a big claim, then we begin to appreciate the important role it plays in any re-evaluation of what it means to do critical work in the university today. This will allow us the opportunity to pause and um, to really consider the policy implications of our current work practices. We don't do that very often, to consider the policy implications of our current work practices. In the case of the, uh, those of you who are younger, the policy implications of your current study practices. To make the case intellectually and politically for unhurried time to safeguard our contemporary public research cultures, and I stress public there. We need to provide spaces for our encounters with intensity and complexity and for open-ended inquiry. And we need to extend these encounters from our research to our teaching, offering the next generation the experience of slow and immersed thought. To do this, we need to take the responsibility of revaluing the values that support our intellectual work, to challenge prevailing policies, orders, and orthodoxies. This means there's a political element to the work that we do, even if we don't consider our work having political intent. We need to reject in clear and considered terms the imperatives of the, the market economy and the reduction of our critical thought to the knowledge economy. I mean, the very term should make us quake, the knowledge economy. As, um, as such, slow philosophy offers a space to begin the positive work of rethinking the future, of moving beyond facts and the accumulation of knowledge toward a comprehensive understanding of education or Bildung and an appreciation of the critical role of ideas. So that's the end of the first section. The second section, revaluing our values. The call to slow philosophy is simultaneously politi political, aesthetic, and professional. One of the ways that we can begin to take responsibility for revaluing the values that support our intellectual work is to explore these domains, the political, the aesthetic, and the professional, and to inquire into their various intersections. And I'll do that as I speak here today. So slow philosophy is a contemporary reminder that philosophy is first and foremost about reflective and transformative thought. It's an approach to philosophy that provides avenues for attentive and intense encounters with our world. Slow philosophy begins with slow reading and this opens our attention to complexity in its myriad manifestations. Slow reading prepares us for our intense encounters with thought and this in turn prepares us for the kind of responsibility 
that we might think of as characteristic of our political or even democratic being. So my argument's quite strong in that sense, that I'm making a claim that slow philosophy founds the possibility for a more democratic and political awareness, uh, and that that's important. Slow philosophy reaches back to the instituting moment of Western philosophy to reposition the love of wisdom as the proper work of philosophy. This instituting moment, or sometimes we refer to it as a guiding idea, inhabits uh, early philosophical work, the antique, orienting it toward an attentive relation with everyday life. So at the beginning, in, in terms of Western philosophy, Western philosophy starts as a practice, as practice, as life practice, a series of what some have referred to as um, spiritual practices, we would now say philosophical practices or reflective practices that actually make us better people. Philosophy now has moved enormously far from that position. Um, the work that's carried out in, in this uh, earlier version of this Greek version of, of philosophy is transformational, a journey offering new possibilities for living consciousness. Justice in this case entails more than knowledge, it entails living a just life. Philosophy becomes a way of life, not simply a set of ideas about it, or more significantly, a set of arguments about it. Importantly for the ancients, philosophy involves opening, some, um, opening to something that exceeds the self, the individual, a transformative experience propelling the philosopher from one existential state to another. Now, like Socrates, the philosopher strives to move ever closer to wisdom. What wisdom is is, is debatable, uh, but we might simply think of wisdom at one level being um, uh, a, an open relation, um, an attentive and reflective relation to complexity, for example. Um, while this love of wisdom founds philosophy in the West, over time, this transformational uh, experience falls prey to philosophy as institution. So it starts out as a practice for becoming better people, but over time, we know historically from the move from Plato to Aristotle and well beyond, it becomes institutionalized. It becomes an institution. The institution, in, in my book, I argue for the complexity of what happens when institutions are founded. But one of the obvious things is that the institution sediments laws and, and uh, orients itself around specific codes. And often that means that the kind of creative, imagina imaginative openness that's, that, that, that gives the impetus to that institution is over time lost. Um, this new approach to philosophy is guided uh, so once it's become institutionalized, this new approach to philosophy is guided by a technical application of knowledge, a kind of bureaucratic reasoning in the 20th century, we would call it, rather than by wisdom. Over time, a forensic desire to know and to manipulate displaces philosophy as a guide to living. In such authoritative forms of knowledge, system and certainty displace a slow and transformative engagement with the strangeness of the world. Thought confines itself to facts, alternative or otherwise. And by the 20th century, we can talk about a kind of instrumental rationality or calculative thinking that is, in effect, a flight from thinking. It is not thinking. The kind of thoughtlessness that philosophers such as Hannah Arendt, Martin Heidegger, and Theodor Adorno warn us against. Instrumental thought is incapable of collecting itself, of hesitating, contemplating. Instrumental thought contains by systematizing, establishing rules, regulations, and limits. It quantifies, measures, calculates. Speed and efficiency displace the slow, reflective meditation that philosophy has once been. By reintroducing the value of attentive contemplation, slow philosophy revitalizes the instituting moment of Western philosophy as a love of wisdom. Now, because this love of wisdom both precedes and founds uh, the institution of philosophy, it remains internal to it, which is why we can regain it, inhabiting the tradition as its repressed guiding idea. Slow philosophy restores 
the love of wisdom um, and philosophy as a way of life to its rightful place in the practice of philosophy today, or at least this is the aim of my work. However, in a time where internet scrolling and scanning and skimming and tweeting and newspeak dominate much of the intellectual landscape, slow philosophy has its work cut out for it. Now, I'm certainly not against uh, contemporary technology or, or social media, but if that's all we have, we're in trouble. Slowness sits uneasily in a culture devoted to speed and to haste. Paul Sillier has talked about this, reminding us that speed is actually not a virtue in itself. We forget this. Speed is not a virtue in itself. And that efficiency is not necessarily helpful in our attempts to engage complexity in meaningful and creative ways. Efficiency in some areas may be good, but in thinking, maybe, maybe not. Encounters with complexity are rarely the result of an environment dominated by high pressure, high pressure time demands. All the more reasons for philosophers to demonstrate the importance of such an education in thinking. The atmosphere or mood of our dominant cultural institutions is at odds with the kind of attentive and critical engagement slow philosophy demands. Speed, efficiency, and interchangeability threaten the possibility of, of thought. And if we fail to think, we fail to question. Uh, sorry, if we fail to think, we fail to realize our humanity. If we fail to think, we fail to discover new paths, to innovate, to question, and to challenge. We might well say that we fail to dwell. Dwelling in this sense is the philosophical attitude of staying or being with things in ways that enable a thoughtful existence to emerge. And this takes time. So the idea of a thoughtful existence is, to my mind, a really important element of what we're doing or what we should be doing when we're doing work at universities, trying to enable the, the development of a thoughtful existence. Now, at present, the institution is dominated by destructively instrumental and competitive relations, relations that benefit the, in, the institution and damage the individual. We need to think carefully about the dangers of uncritically adopting a corporate mentality where output and production place unrealistic and unhealthy time restrictions on the work of thought that we each undertake. However, by reclaiming the pleasures of a collaborative teaching, learning, and thinking, we can to some extent resist the pressures of the modern institution, or at least we can try. So on the one hand, the metrics of value pushes those of us who work academically into a competitive uh, context that focuses very largely still on research, and particularly in the humanities at least, on individual research. Um, the argument for slow philosophy drawing on a number of things is to say that in balance, when our research occurs within the context of a collegial teaching um, uh, and, and a pleasure in the process of teaching, that that's one way that we can actually be undermining the, the whole, in a sense, the whole concept of the metrics of value. Um, it's important, I think, I can't say how important it is, I can't stress how, enough how important it is that our relations with our colleagues be collegial and important as well that our relations with our students, both graduate and undergraduate, be supportive and mentoring. So that brings us to the third section. So as I've mentioned, the call to slow philosophy is both a political and an aesthetic one. It is additionally a professional one. Now, professionally, it's fundamentally concerned with considering, reconsidering what philosophy is as a discipline and a practice within the scholarly institution. So that's professionally what we do. Politically, it's concerned with how philosophy can speak to the world outside the institution, outside the university, as well as with how that world in turn impacts the institutional domain. So it's like the relevance factor in, in so many ways. And aesthetically, slow philosophy concerns itself with the complex ways the philosopher exists, sometimes in tension, probably more often than not in tension, as both academic and as citizen in both professional and political worlds. 
Slow philosophy is, importantly, a call to resist the kind of instrumental work that reduces thinking to information extraction or mining. It, frust <clears throat> it frustrates the modern technological drive that threatens to reduce thinking to a productive resource. Slow philosophy is rather an attention to thought, a rare and intense meditation that transforms us from one state to another. Intensity is the process of change. This takes time. Slow philosophy schools us in the art of sitting with the world, a kind of waiting and attentive dwelling that opens us to complexity. Slow philosophy inculcates habits uh, of attention to the world, enabling us to be transformed by our encounters with complex and demanding thoughts. In slow philosophy, we explore the importance of unhurried time in establishing our encounters with the world. In a certain sense, this places slow philosophy alongside aesthetic experience, alongside art. Both involve patience and the suspension of certainty. Both explore ambiguity by hesitating, deliberating, and taking time. Patience, attention, and waiting provide the grounds of a slowing that allows thought to emerge and respectfully open to the world. As such, slow philosophy turns its back on the haste of everyday purposeful or productive activity, but even as it is swept up by it. So I'm not trying to say we can we are somehow magically outside of it. We're swept up by it, but we work against it. Art too requires time and patience. Art provides us with opportunities to stop and to reconsider the things we think we know. Art and slow philosophy offer us, I think, different paths towards dwelling on the things of the world, different avenues to thinking and contemplation. Both art and slow philosophy move us beyond calculation to thought. Slow philosophy is, above all, the cultivation of a heightened attentiveness that allows us to engage complex and demanding thoughts. Unhurried time provides the ground necessary for such attentiveness to emerge. However, slow philosophy is not simply opposed to speed. In certain contexts, speed is both desirable and necessary. In slow philosophy, the issue is not to pit fast against slow, but more significantly to differentiate between slowness and haste. Haste is never helpful when we're engaging with complex thoughts or attempting to encounter, intent, um, encounter the strangeness or ambiguity of the world. Slowness, un unlike haste, provides the ground for an intense relation with the, um, with the strangeness of the world. Intense encounters with complex thoughts form us in ways that we cannot predict. Wonder at what is strange in other is the beginning of our formation as thoughtful beings through intense encounters. Wonder slows us, urging us to pause, to consider what we do not know, perhaps what we can't know. Wonder initiates us into the realm of the other, providing us with an attentive awareness of the rare and the new. Wonder is the passion of moving toward, the slow encounter that uncovers the things, uncovers the things of the world. Wonder is the slow approach, the meandering path, that allows us to fully experience our proximate world. Attentive listening can provide the context for wonder to emerge. Listening provides a context of proximity and nearness, one at odds with thinking reduced to calculation or to knowledge narrowly defined. Attentive listening receives without being passive, or, or perhaps it's better to say that it receives with an active form of passivity. Attentive listening keeps wonder and questioning alive, and because of this, it's a privileged mode of our nearness with, with what is other and strange. Listening helps us literally to pay attention, to pause, to collect ourselves, rather than to extract a singular, ambiguous meaning or message. Listening is an attitude of attentiveness that orients us back toward the world, an attentiveness to what sounds obscure and strange and other. When we really listen, we suspend our usual inclination to pass a hasty judgment or decide definitively. Listening helps us to avoid the finality of the verdict. It helps us to re uh, register the habitual ways in which we rush to a judgment without patiently waiting for the full complexity of thought to emerge. 
Listening fosters conversation, dialogue, and engagement with others. It offers alternatives to grasping the world so as to simply integrate it into our pre-existing worldview. Slow philosophy provides a slow attentive mode that enables our open engagement with thought. And this slowness can, however, take various forms. For example, if we look to musical notation and tempo, we discover that slowness exists along a continuum from moderately to very slow. Between the moderate walking pace of andante and the extremely slow gait of laghissimo, we discover the possibilities of andante morgato, adagietto, adagio uh, laghetto, lago lento, and crave. Additionally, we encounter ritardando and rallentandando, both indicating a gradual slowing down. Now, it's useful to think of slow philosophy as thought that occurs along this entire um, continuum, or even along the entire continuum of tempo. Of course, to stretch this musical analogy a little further, we observe that while musical performance is in effect fleeting and ephemeral, it takes long hours of rehearsal and practice um, to obtain proficiency, let alone virtuosity, and to maintain it. At any given moment, the openness and attention we seek so as to engage the strangeness and complexity of the world may be accessible to us in a number of ways. Slowness may characterize our initial encounter with complexity, and yet successive encounters may occur in quite diverse ways. Slow engagements may build over time to sudden bursts of insight, where, however fleetingly, we engage the complexity of the world in a fully attentive manner. The moment of the famous aha lebnis is one way of imagining the culmination of slow and attentive thought in a moment of instant gestalt or epiphany. The heightened attention or fine-tuned attention to detail and nuance that slow philosophy encourages draws us closer to the aesthetic experience wherein we sink slowly into the atmosphere or the mood of the work. In this, we experience an openness to thought an unhurried reception, a meditative relation, a patience, a waiting, an intimacy, a wondrous appreciation, an attentive listening, a kind of grace, the grace of a purely transformative attention. Now with Simon Ve, we can speak of a grace that abandons the gravity of a self-centered and self-aggrandizing philosophy. Slow philosophy foregoes the gravity of the world, uh, sorry, the gravity of the self, to encounter the possibility of ethics. It teaches a discerning quality of attention and is quite simply an unhurried approach toward thinking and thought. Slow philosophy opens an attentive, receptive space where ethics and aesthetics meet. In fact, it's this quality of attention, the intensity of engagement, that returns philosophy to its earliest vocation, ethics. Slow philosophy restores the formative potential of thinking and thought making philosophy once again a practice for enhancing life. It's quite warm. <laughs> it, it, you're right. This discerning or meditative openness to the world may seem quaint from the perspective of an instrumental or productive mentality. Indeed, the very term slow in the modern age brings with it a host of very negative connotations, one that we would do well in uh, to question. Now, in English alone, the term slow has come to suggest sluggish, not quick, not clever, blunt, uninteresting, dull, dull-witted, slothful, and stupid. From around 1841, slow equates with the terms dull and tedious, suggesting that such pejorative connotations arise simultaneously with early industrialized society and the theories of progress and efficiency that accompany it. So there's an economic uh, and very social, very political context for our appreciation of the term. Slow philosophy contests these connotations without, at the same time, attempting to elevate slowness into a wholly positive value. Absolutely not. Clearly, there are contexts in which speed is both necessary and desirable. However, without a foundation of slow and careful thought, speed can all too quickly become haste. And as I've suggested, haste involves a hurried, an uncareful relation with the world and is therefore never helpful for thought. 
haste fails to engage with complexity, reducing our ability for radical reflection and good judgment. Haste, like the current US president, tweets without thinking and without considering the consequences. Okay, we are up to the very brief fourth section, responsibility and political engagement. Slow philosophy engages the nuance and complexity that so many of our contemporary cultural institutions, government included, ignore. For this reason, it provides us with educational possibilities that we should not overlook. If responsibility founds our political engagement in society, then slow philosophy is a means toward the kind of critical thinking that produces us as responsible political beings. Such responsibility, however, requires that our educational institutions both acknowledge and protect the time required for real thought to emerge. In an age of productivity and efficiency very narrowly defined, this is increasingly less likely to occur. Given this, we can suggest that one of the important roles of our schools and our universities should be to stage a kind of untimeliness that safeguards time for thought. Food for thought, perhaps. In a time of unprecedented attacks on education funding and reform here in Australia and elsewhere, the need to protect spaces of learning as spaces for thinking, the need to protect spaces of learning as spaces for thinking is ever more pressing. As Arendt very clearly understands, the aim of totalitarian education has never been to instill convictions but to destroy the capacity to form any. The aim of totalitarian education has never been to instill convic convictions, but to destroy the capacity to form any. An education in thinking is the best antidote, antidote to such unthinkingness. And I contend that slow philosophy offers us, in, offers us lessons in where and how to begin. So while the role of the university and of course, today, of course, we've been talking about the Euro European model of the university. While the role of the university has most certainly changed throughout the centuries, it has retained a special relation with knowledge. And when this knowledge is severed from terms such as Bildung and critical thought and opposed to ideas and education, we need to be attentive to who and what this knowledge serves. Slow philosophy is a call to attend to this situation, a reminder that universities are for transformation rather than simply for information. Transformation takes time, and rather than overthrowing something, it can also involve withdrawing support. For example, withdrawing support for existing instrumental practices, practices that reduce to the university to what Boris Groys has recently described as a seductive resource, an institution of capital and investment. So the university as a seductive resource, an institution of capital and investment. Thought and thinking are keys uh, to transformation and the possibility of change. And this change is at least partially ethically connected with our ability to identify and reveal suffering and injustice taken us quite a while to get here, but that's really the point. Along with the ability to think critically, to think carefully, to think deeply, is the sense in which that opens us up to the ability to identify and reveal suffering and injustice. Okay, we've reached the postscript. Slow philosophy and slow activism, which is also brief. Now around the world, Slow movements and slow activism provide the underside of, <clears throat> sorry, slow movements and slow activism expose the underside of a neoliberal capitalist thinking <clears throat> Let me start again. Around the world, slow movements and slow activism expose the underside of a neoliberal capitalist thinking by acknowledging complicity with a system 
that benefits both materially and culturally from the exploitation of the non-Western and the natural world. This critical self-awareness among people in affluent countries is more and more a defining feature of what marks a practice as slow. In the global south, slow movements manifest as a concern with slow urbanism and slow governance, exploring connections between urban cities, economic downturns, migration, dispossession, expulsion, and exclusion. How more relevant could these themes be in Germany today? In these contexts, there's an intimate relation between slow activism and Australia too, I must note. There's an intimate relation between slow activism and the just reclamation of common land. Now, while there's considerable diversity in the way slowness is embraced by grass movement, grassroots movements around the world, what unites them is arguably a determination to experience the pleasure of engaging the basic needs of everyday life with a kind of artful slowness. Such movements seek a more substantial and sustained relation with the complexity and the beauty of the world. Carl Honoré's book, In Praise of Slowness, first published in 2004, explored how industrialized societies could think of slowness in terms of a movement with the potential to challenge the belief that faster is always better. But since this time, slow movements have evolved to more consciously embrace practices of slow activism throughout the globe. In part, this activism involves challenging our roles as passive consumers in capitalist systems devoted to unchecked economic growth and exchange. Reclaiming slowness extends also to cultural spaces devoted to thought. As we've seen today, the equation of speed and haste with efficiency is embedded in a classical European style of instrumental rational thought, where attention gives way to calculation and thinking in general is reduced to an empty technical manipulation and application of fact. Slow philosophy is the practice of resisting the kind of thought that is incapable of collecting itself, pausing, considering, and contemplating. In this, it's particularly, it is a particularly deep felt and critically reflective form of slow activism. Just as slow movements draw in modern and contemporary ways on non-dominant practices, so too slow philosophy. Slow philosophy is a practice that challenges an instrumental relation with life. It is, above all, the cultivation of a heightened attentiveness. It provides intense encounters that open us to the beauty and the strangeness of the world. And this intensity is what arguably lies at the heart of all slow activism. So we've reached, we've, we've managed to get through all of those in the heat. And now we're at this very end point, which is just really a way of getting um, you to start speaking and, and voicing your own concerns. But what are universities for? That's one way of posing the questions. I think another way of posing that question is, what should universities be for? What should universities for? We know, in a sense, I've argued what universities are for in my paper. Um, or what they what they have become. I, now the question is, what should universities be for? What might they be for again, or what might they become? Okay, so um, we looked at the question throughout the paper. I kept arguing that transformation is key here. That the the notion of building and education is is built upon this idea of a transformation that actually makes us better people, the, the formation. I do not have to explain that to Germans. Bildung here, as opposed, in a sense, to, to mere a very limited notion of knowledge or information. Now, knowledge and information are in, their, in the right place and in the right context are not problematic, but if no, knowledge very narrowly defined is the only agenda, and if information very narrowly defined is the only agenda, that's a problem. And then thought and ideas having precedence, in a sense, over facts. So in a, in a simple sense, that's kind of like what universities might be for. 
That's one way of thinking about it. So come back to the question, what are universities for? What should they be for? Perhaps these thoughts. Here are a few thoughts. Universities should be for enabling our encounters with complexity. Universities should be about exploring, contesting, questioning, and transforming. Resisting thoughtlessness and instrumental thought. University, or th instrumental thought here being um, uh, thought uncoupled from ethical or moral or political concerns. Uh, universities should reject the imperatives of the market economy and the reduction of our critical thought to the knowledge economy. Safe, universities should be about safeguarding our contemporary public, public research cultures. It's really important. Universities should be about fostering conversation, dialogue, and engagement. Universities should be about encouraging our responsibility as thoughtful political citizens. Universities should be able to stage untimeliness by encouraging and project, uh, protecting unhurried time. Good luck on that one. Universities should cultivate a heightened attentiveness by providing the time and space for intense encounters. Universities should be involved in transforming us from one state to another. This is the process of ethics. And that, that transformation being something along the lines of an openness to the other. Universities should be involved in the ethical project of identifying and revealing suffering and justice. And finally, Universities should be involved in an education in thinking that cultivates wisdom and safeguards the dignity of thought. Thank you.